My name is Chris Hoffman. I'm the CEO of Rhino Motors. We manufacture a single wheel electric motorcycle. It's 12 miles an hour, 25 mile range. You've seen it around. Uh, I'll ride it around later on today. And certainly go on the internet, rhinomotors.com, and uh, help yourself to understand the full story. But what I'd like to talk today is about is the subject we're, um, we're here to kind of understand is the, um, how does this work? There we go. The rise of the machines. So we are surrounded by machinery today. Uh, it's everywhere. And to really appreciate where all this started and, and kind of how it interacts with the human experience. I went for a walk yesterday with my sister on her farm in rural Texas. And we stumbled across some history right out in the farm fields. It was just amazing. And if you look in the upper left, uh, there's a little piece of hardware there with a pulley on it. And that pulley would have been connected to a steam engine. And so the advent of the steam engine allowed designers to create things that saved labor and made people's lives different. And as we evolved through World War II, what came out was a 50 horsepower gas engine left over from you know, some Jeep or some tank or something. But these 50 horsepower engines were so cheap that it launched an entire industrial revolution in the farm implement area where you know, here's a combine. So that allowed you know, one little thing changed and innovation happened. You know, so there's this little piece of standard equipment, you know, which is an example for a lot of things that we live around. There's all these little leaps that happen. And the leap that you know, happened for me was the accelerometer gyro. So the little thing that's in your screen and your laptop that, makes your, you know, that knows where the center of the earth is, is in my bike. It's the size of a, you know, an aspirin. So what are you gonna do with not a 50 horsepower engine? What are you gonna do with a little gyro? So as an innovator, you know, I ended up with kind of a serendipitous event where I'm riding out to go fishing with my daughter, age 13, and she says, hey, Daddy, I saw this one-wheeled motorcycle in a video game. Could you actually build that? And I'm an older engineer, and, and instead of getting all excited, I try to, kill, try to figure out how to kill the idea as soon as possible. So you get on the internet, and you try to figure out, like, what's going to stop me from doing this? And, you know, you find the gyro. Look, there's, like, these little electric her helicopters. I can buy a gyro for 10 bucks. And then I can buy a motor controller for 150 bucks because the BattleBots TV show came out and there's this whole cottage industry of people building that stuff. And then, all right, here's the wheel and the tire. So I finally just took a machine shop class and we built the first prototype. It's gorgeous. Looks just like it came out of a video game. Totally unrideable. <laughs> so, I mean, it would ride about 20 feet and you couldn't, you couldn't steer it. It was ridiculous. So my software guy and I got together and we finally said, all right, what are we gonna do? And we're talking flywheels and, and all this expensive two wheels and all this. And I said, look, dude, this has gotta be cheap. So all we can do is add steering like on a bike. And you know, that makes no sense. I mean, like, what are you gonna do with the handlebars? You know, it's one wheel. So we did it anyways. And we decided, look, if this thing rides, awesome. If it doesn't, we're done. So we got on this thing, rode it around the neighborhood in five minutes. It was amazing. So just by adding the steering, allowed us to build this bike. So this is the bike that's in all those YouTube videos. There's like 19 million views on some of these videos out right now. And it's just grinding away because there's something about this bike that people, you know, they just love this bike. So I managed to put together a, you know, a team of experts and a board of advisors and we started asking ourselves, well, what, you know, what are we gonna do with this thing? How are we gonna roll it out in the market? And we ended up thinking that the street legal, the street legal scooter space was where the money was. We had a choice. We could do Segway, you know, kind of 12 miles an hour, or we could do 25 miles an hour. But 25 miles an hour can't be more than 700 watts of power. This thing's got 2,000 watts of power. But we did it anyways, and it failed miserably. It just wasn't enough power. It looked gorgeous. And at the same time, I got an order for five of these things for $25,000 a piece. I'm tooling up to like build them on my garage and I meet this, my CEO, I mean, my, I'm sorry, my COO, my operations guy, and he says to me, dude, you know, if you build those five bikes in your garage, you're gonna get stuck there for the rest of your life. You know, let's just stop. You know, let's go out and write a business plan that proves this company will scale. And if it won't scale, you're wasting your time. So we took six months and we went out and found like real numbers, talked to real Segway dealers, talked to motorsports dealers, and put together some solid ironclad numbers and pitched it to investors, not with how smart we are, but we talked about how we had a plan to get smarter. And that built a trust, you know, with, with, these, with the investors. So, with, you know, $1.5 million, we had a shot. 
at doing something right. And so how do you do that? So the first thing we did was we understood, you know, what does this thing do? When we're riding it around in the city, how does it show up? What is it about it that makes people excited? And what features do they want? We talked to the police department and all this, and they want replaceable batteries, and they want this parking bar thing in the front. And so as an engineer, I could, you know, I could, I could re-engineer this bike mechanically to meet these market demands, but how do you make it beautiful? You know, how, as an, like a mechanical engineer, do I figure out in, for myself how to design something that's actually beautiful? And what I discovered was I had to really change my own psychology almost. I had to you know, get over my fear of failure. I had to you know, stop listening to other people. Like this whole, I listened to my advisors. You know, I wanted to go into the Segway scooter space. But you know, they were pushing me for this bigger market. So I really had to start to own my own experience and my own vision. And I had to feel what this bike was for me. And what I realized for me, riding this thing around, is it creates the experience of riding into a coliseum on two horses bareback. And that's what I'm selling. That's what people resonate with. They want to be that guy too. So I had to figure out how to take that feeling in my body and turn it into hardware. And it's, it's an emotionally gut-wrenching experience. A lot of prototypes and cut cardboard and carved foam and, and angsting about it. We're not there yet. And, you know, it's, it's, I just have to say that be prepared to be changed, you know, by your experience with these companies. And you look at the, the Jaguar XKE, I mean, you look at that car, it's sexy. So the guy that designed that car didn't just try to make it shiny. He felt it in his body. Like, how do I feel the experience of driving this car? And how do I make that in a piece of hardware? So my fan is the Bowerbird. The Bowerbird designs this presentation of how it feels to attract a mate. So it's, it's, it's an erotic experience of creativity that he's completely unattached to. He's not hustling it. He's not hard selling it on you. He's building it because it's beautiful and it represents who he is. So that's the kind of confidence you have to have is just be an innovator and be confident about what you are doing. And, and be ready to go out into the market and, and build something that you're passionate about because you're the only one that knows that can be that. So that's kind of the biggest part of um, the book that I'm writing, Heart and Gear, is, is talks about all of that innovation, how do you become a better innovator and find yourself. And now I want to talk about my future of uh, transportation. So I think the future of transportation has to be about saving time. Absolutely. We don't care about saving the planet. Nobody cares about saving $20 a month for gas. They want to save time. I want to be home with my kids a half an hour early. And the thing that's wrong with our transportation is nobody knows where to park. 30% of the people in the city are riding around looking for parking. And, you know, like the self-driving car and autonomous vehicle stuff is never going to happen. It's never going to happen. All these people are spending billions of dollars trying to make autonomous vehicles happen on the freeway and in the city. And the minute you get it past 50%, we're going to have gridlock. I'm sorry. But at five miles an hour, if I can drive up to a store and have my car go park itself in a designated parking place, like a parking vending machine, and if this car has standard lift points that allow it to be picked up by automation and put into a start parking structure in three minutes. And I can go to my phone and say, call my car down to this address and the car will come down and pick me up. I think that scenario will work. And so what really is missing with our transportation system is, is long haul, point to point, people transportation and you get a car at your destination. It's actually backwards. We're driving all these cars around but the cars need to be stacked up at the train station, at downtown locations, out in you know, the, the suburbs, and get everybody on a train that's a high-speed train and take you from car vending machine to car vending machine. Because people want a car. And they want a car that is safe to drive in the city. They want an SUV-style driving experience. They want to be up high. They want to be surrounded by this big rubber bumper. And they want a car that's cheap. I mean, you look at low-income people, and they're hit the hardest by not having transportation that's affordable and transportation that gets them to their jobs downtown. I mean, there's, there's restaurants that can't even, 
keep a restaurant open because they can't afford to pay the people to work there because they can't get to work. So the transportation system for me has to get cars off the freeway. It's, you know, and, and nothing's gonna change. So there's a certain amount of leadership that people need to embrace and we can't wait around for government to change anything. I mean, this room is filled with people, I can feel it, that you know, can make things happen. We, you know, we as people can make choices and we as people can influence what happens you know, in our cities from a local level. This, this proposal that I'm talking about here, you can build an entire parking structure, fill it full of these cars for less money than a concrete poured structure, and it will generate more revenue than the parking spaces in a concrete structure. So again, I'm asking, who's gonna lead this conversation? Who's gonna build the future of urban transportation? And who's gonna step forward? Thank you very much.